Uh, first, Abby Benninghoff is a Professor and Interim Department Head of Animal, Dairy, and Vet Sciences and Associate Dean for Research and Graduate and Student Services. She's not busy at all. Uh, Brent Chamberlain, who is Associate Professor in Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. And Eloisa Vertigliano is Associate Professor in Animal, Dairy, and Vet Sciences. And Elizabeth Varghese is Associate Professor in Biological Engineering. We have a whole panel of really smart people here today, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, presentation today. Let's jump in and go if you each use the microphone. Good morning, or almost afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Abby Benninghoff, and actually tomorrow is my last official duty as Associate Dean for Research, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, so I got to speak to ETE about six years ago about a passion of mine, and that's mentoring and research. And since that time, uh, I've really wanted to expand or um, have some of my colleagues be as excited as I am about mentoring. So I've been bringing some people under the tent, talking about how we can advance uh, the skills of faculty in mentoring and how we can do a better job at meeting our student needs, especially those undergraduates and graduate students that look for that experiential learning through engaging in research and scholarship. <clears throat> so in the past six years, as I've been bringing these people together, we've been brainstorming on how can we enhance mentoring campus-wide. So I wanted to introduce to you our group's long-term goal that we're hoping to get some feedback from you today on is to create a year-long professional development program for USU mentors, so for faculty and graduate students who are engaged in mentoring, so that we can support and enhance mentor and mentee relationships. So ultimately, you'll hear today about a proposal that's been informed by our experience receiving some training in how to facilitate mentor uh, professional development, and then our experience delivering some pilot workshops. I do wanna tell you my team are some really great people, and I am interested in expanding this team because ultimately to make this uh, advancing mentoring program work, we're gonna need more people who are passionate about this who are looking to advance their mentoring skills. So we're gonna to hear today from Brent Chamberlain, who is also in the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. He is now an associate professor, and he has a lot of great ideas about working with students on an individual basis, really making those relationships solid. Dr. Eloise Rutigliano is an associate professor, primarily focused on our School of Veterinary Medicine and the new College of Veterinary Medicine, and she thinks a lot about curriculum and how we can enhance mentoring those one-on-one -on -one experiences with students. So I'm really excited to have Eloise on board. And then Dr. Elizabeth Varghis has been recognized for her outstanding mentorship of students. She's got a whole passel of undergrads and graduate students working with her in biological engineering, and she brings a really unique perspective of those mentoring relationships to our team. So why is mentoring important? Um, these are some topics that have been informed by a whole body of literature, and we'll have a link here in the slides where you can go and identify some of that literature if you want to dig into these topics further. But we want to enhance the identity and that self of belonging and self-efficacy of our students. They need to feel part of our teams and integrated into our programs and still have that sense of ownership of their experience. Persistence. For anybody who's mentored a student through a challenging graduate program, one of the best skills those students can develop is persistence to get through the troubleshooting and the challenges so that they get through and complete their degree, hopefully in a timely fashion. We're also looking for increased research productivity. We want those students to be able to get their research completed and disseminated to the public to help them in their career advancement. It's to their advantage but also as people who manage research programs, we need productive programs and we rely on students to make that happen. High career satisfaction. A strong mentor-mentee relationship should enable both the mentor and the mentee to be uh, fulfilled in their work, to be happy to go to work. I mean, that's always my goal, to have students that are excited to come into work, to solve problems, to learn something new every day, and hopefully that is something they can take to their future mentor relationships. 
We also want to make sure that we address diversity in our mentor relationships. So we are looking to enhance the recruitment of underrepresented minorities um, and under students from underrepresented groups in research experiences. So this is the link. If you, this I think will be available um, in the recording. So if you would like to identify more information, you can go to tinyurl.com slash mentor literature. So with that, I'm gonna pass the baton over to my colleague, Dr. Digliano. All right. Okay, so our team um, is proposing, like Abby mentioned, a year-long professional development um, uh, workshop series to enhance mentor-mentee relationships. But in order for us to get to that point, there were a few steps that we had to take before that. So we had to participate in a mentoring training, and we're also trained to lead mentor trainings uh, by the Simmer group, and I'll talk about the Simmer program in a second. The second step that we took was to conduct a pilot session with some of these mentoring uh, themes that I'll show you in a, in a few slides. And we conducted these pilot sessions at USU with colleagues collect, to collect feedback and, um, and fine tune our proposal. So I will start by giving you an introduction and an overview of the training we participated in. And then we're gonna model some of that, uh, some of those themes that were presented to us that we would present to USU mentors. And then Brent is gonna talk about the feedback that we received and the proposal that we are coming up with. So as Abby mentioned, effective mentoring uh, relationships are critical for developing the next generation of researchers. So as she mentioned, it increases diversity and inclusion and productivity in the research environment. So the CIMR uh, facilitator training, um, the mission of that, uh, uh, that training is to uh, improve research mentoring relationships for mentees and mentors at all stages of career development through the implementation, development, and the study of evidence-based and culturally responsive practices. So they offer, the CIMR uh, training facilitator after, offer two curricula. Uh, one is the entering uh, mentoring for mentors of research trainees, and the other curriculum is uh, entering research for research trainees. So we were introduced to the entering mentoring curriculum and we're also, like I mentioned before, we're also trained to facilitate those trainings at our institutions. So in the training that we participated in, um, the mentors were, um, uh, we were engaged in activities, assignments, case studies, and facilitated discussions to determine the best practices for solving pro uh, mentoring challenges and to share uh, our experiences as mentors. Uh, the facilitators, our facilitators, enabled us to take ownership of our learning through helping us with reflection on best practices and solutions to challenges in mentoring and also shared discovery. Uh, so it's important to, to mention that the facilitators in this training, in this case us, we do not have to be experts in uh, mentoring. The point here is for us to facilitate reflection for the mentors to identify uh, what works and what doesn't in a mentor-mentee relationship. So this is what our facilitator training looks like. And it was delivered virtually in the fall of 2021. So we had six sessions of about two to two and a half hours long. Um, it's usually, uh, oftentimes it's held in person and the in-person version of it is a two day, a two eight hour day um, uh, commitment. Uh, the cost is about, it's a little under $2,000 per person. Uh, this cost was covered uh, uh, because we participate in the Aspire iChange initiative. Um, so 
In our case, because it was held virtually, the sessions were spread uh, throughout the course of a week. <coughs> so the themes that were covered in this training are uh, listed here. So they included addressing equity and inclusion, aligning expectations between the mentor and the mentee, articulating mentoring philosophy and mentoring plans, assessing understanding, cultivating ethical behavior, enhancing work-life integration, fostering independence and well-being of the mentee, maintaining effective communication, promoting professional development, and promoting research self-efficacy. So the portal that we were given access to looks something like this. So they list uh, a lot of activities and case studies that you can choose from. So like I mentioned, we went through the training of to become effective mentors, but also we, were, we went through the training to facilitate these mentor, this mentoring trainings. So if when we are um, developing our own mentoring training, we can go to this portal and select a series of activities and case studies and discussion questions that can be used in that training. This portal also gives us access to an assessment platform of the workshop series that we're going to offer. So right now, Elizabeth is going to go over uh, how one of the, our themes would be delivered in this workshop series we're proposing. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me? And not too breathy either. Okay, so um, just as Eloisa said, once we became trained facilitators, we went through that training in September and then we wanted to spend basically the fall semester coming up with a pilot workshop. And so we became familiar with both the Simmer portal and the different types of curricula and assignments and case studies that might be available to us. And it's very well detailed, and so there's frameworks of what the schedule should look like and what opportunities the participants in this training uh, might have available to them. So I just wanted to run through uh, an example of one of the workshops, and this is the workshop that I ran in the pilot. And so we started with aligning expectations, which is probably one of the main components of supporting a mentor-mentee relationship. So this workshop took about one hour, a little over an hour, um, and it had an introduction and check-in. It had a case study that we all discussed, and we, then we ended up with the mentor-mentee contracts. And so we started with an introduction, and aligning expectations is not something that was difficult to motivate for participants, but we wanted to make sure that we were all aligned and on the same page, and so a critical element of any effective mentor-mentee relationship is a shared understanding of what each person, person expects. Problems often arise due to misunderstandings about expectations, and the thing is that expectations may change over time, both on the mentor and the mentee's level. And so being able to not only have some shared expectations and goals, but allowing frequent reflection and clear communication and allowing for changes in these is an important component of, a, an, a, of an effective mentor-mentee relationship. And so then we would basically do a check-in. And we did our pilot workshop over Zoom. We'd like to do this in person. So this type of check-in might need to happen. We did it you know, with like a polling, um, but you could do like a Zoom survey, a Google Doc, you know, poll everywhere, raising hands, anyway, and, you know, any way that you wanna do this type of check-in to promote um, the, the initial, uh, the facilitators and the participants being together, and so the check-in was, what strategies have you used previously to build trust with your mentees? And so then, after that introduction and the check-in, where people are aligned with kind of thinking about how do you share these, how do you clearly communicate and align your expectations, we then dive into a case study. And again, these are all developed by the Simmer program, and so this was available through the portal. And so I would have somebody in the, some, one of the participants basically read this aloud. And so the gist of this is that Amy is a third year doc student and she has been working on her mentor's previous research, but she needs to transition into becoming more independent. And so how does she do this? Her mentor is very well established and she has enjoyed working on her project, but how does she transition into becoming more independent? 
And then what we transition into is we all read this as a big group, and then we break out into smaller groups of two to three people, and we look at these questions. So what are the main themes raised in the study? What could have been done to avoid the situation, right? So the Amy is a third year doc student, so she's been in, this, in her mentor's lab for a while now. Um, how do you establish and communicate expectations of your mentees? How do you find out your mentees' expectations of you and for their own research experience? And then what strategies for uncovering unspoken expectations um, between mentors and mentees may arise? And so these are kind of more specific. So authorship, job placement, letters of rec. How do you as a mentor deal with some of those um, hidden needs of your mentees? And so you can imagine that I think I said there were 25 minutes for the entire case study and these questions. Obviously, there's not enough time to get through all of these, right? So even if the groups are small, 25 minutes isn't enough. But as Eloisa said, we're not giving you the tools. We're giving you the tools to think about these concerns and issues, not necessarily to come up with, oh, I've solved it. I know everything about mentor and mentee relationships, and everything's going to be perfect. Rather. You know, maybe you have three students and they need this type of relationship and this type of mentoring, but now I'm going to have another set of students and they, ha they, they have different needs. And so it's more of the self-discovery and the reflection of you as a mentor that might al allow you to support your students. So that's like the big chunk of the workshop. But then we wanted to end with something that the, that the participants could leave with. And so we move on to exploring mentoring contracts or compacts. And so this, for this section of the workshop, I basically had two larger groups because we were looking at two different examples of contracts. And so um, I brought up one from the bot lab, which is um, uh, in the Department of Medicine at Stanford. And this contract is very well detailed. Um, so a contract would be something that mentors would either give to incoming mentees or, or mentees in their lab, or potentially could be something that mentors and mentees come up with together. And so this, these are just two examples. And so this is very well thought out. It has very specific instructions on how to communicate, who to go to, uh, best lab practices, expectations. And then I gave a different example, and this is from uh, the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where it's more of a discussion between mentors and mentees, and they come up with the expectations together. And so again, I uh, split our group into two, into two larger groups. They each got the links to these. They could look at it in more detail. I've only provided screenshots. The bot lab one is like 12 pages. This one is about two. And so they could come together and then uh, describe you know, pros and cons or what they thought of that. OK, and so then we, we, we looked at three of the, training, uh, the curricular themes that Eloisa mentioned. And we decided to run this workshop in, in uh, January. We had 10 to 13 participants on these two different days. And our themes were aligning expectations, addressing equity and inclusion that Brent ran, and fostering independence that Eloisa ran. And so from our participants, we got the following feedback. So they liked, you know, we, we invited anybody who would show up, friends, enemies, collaborators, critics. Um, so we had faculty from different disciplines. The group sizes were pretty small when we broke out into small groups. And they felt that it was a valuable experience for both you know, experienced mentors, junior faculty, but also graduate students who might be in a mentoring uh, relationship, might have mentees that they also mentor. Uh, what we needed to work on was, of course, that we didn't have enough time to discuss questions. Um, we tried different things in the Zoom platform, but maybe <coughs> word clouds or polling would have been more helpful. Um, sometimes the discussion questions didn't make it into the Zoom breakout groups. And then um, the case studies that we were using, we just focused on graduate students, but obviously there's undergraduates, there's, there's um, high school students, there's postdoctoral scholars, and so we needed to be more diverse in our case study selection. And the participants were uh, happy to have the outcomes from the workshops, including the mentoring philosophy, which can be used for promotion and tenure, for annual review, for job search, and then having, having those mentoring contracts was also a special, uh, like a, a tangible item that they got from participating in the workshop, right? So it's something that they could, that we could work on as a group and as individuals by participating in this. All right, so now Brent's gonna talk about what we learned and how we'll move forward. 
Great, thank you. So this is the tip of the iceberg after we went through some of the curriculum and then experienced the pilot study and we said, well, what are we gonna do with this going on in the next year? So um, next year, next two years and, and so on in the future. Um, what we're looking at is to have two different cohorts, so about a dozen different faculty in one and another dozen or so senior graduate students that may be going on to careers in academia or other careers where they would be more directly involved in mentorship. Um, the SEMER training is really geared towards research, scholarship, creative activities, so individuals involved in those processes with mentors uh, would certainly be of, of interest here. Um, so here are the different curriculum that you see on your right, and the idea is that we'd go through a range of these curriculum that would be of interest to the group as it becomes formed. The idea is to have a couple hours per session where we would have sort of some pre-reading so that we can all be prepared and be more effective when we hit the ground running, and then also some follow-up um, post-workshop kinds of reflections and or feedback sessions as well. So the proposal, um, is going to hit not this August, but the idea is that we would run an initial stage the following year. So we'd have this year to kind of work on formalizing this, where we'd have sort of an orientation uh, event similar to, to, you know, we've got a panel today, but maybe something else that we have next year in ETE. And then we'd have applications for people to join this cohort in September. And then each month we would run one of several of those different modules that exist. So for instance, in the aligning expectations, we might come back and say, you know, in a few months, you've now had time to provide an onboarding document or a contract document for you. Let's come back and meet together with a cohort and get some feedback on those because one person's thought might be useful to another person's lab or experience. And then we have some tangible product that we can use and also provide to our mentees as well within and, and mentors and other colleagues within our department. Um, and the idea would be to run these in parallel tracks, not together, because I think we understand there can be some potential power dynamics between faculty and graduate students. There may be some places of crossover, but certainly as a synthesis, we'd want to do that and we'd be um, conscientious of that process. Um, a few benefits to go through. So the Participants that come through this, you know, one of the outcomes would be like a philosophy statement. So if you're involved in P&T, you have to do a teaching philosophy statement. Perhaps you have a research one. I'm guessing you might not have a mentorship one. And that is kind of at the hybrid between teaching and research, right? So let's have a formal statement for that. Um, as well as a contract, though, so that we can align those expectations between those mentors and mentees as we come in. Um, I think also, you know, to build an institutional awareness of mentorship, which will go into the next slide. But I also want to highlight, even from personal experience, since SEMER, I've applied for a few grants. Um, I have received one of those. I have no idea if my mention or inclusion of SEMER in there was useful. But usually having a couple paragraphs of the relationship to how I'm involved with our mentees and how we ap approach project management across faculty um, and students can be useful. So our hope for this is that we're going to try to get involved some institutional offices, so Office of Research, Provost Office, Graduate School. We really want to find a way from, you know, to, to garner resources from colleges and departments. And in particular, not just financial, but also encouragement, yes, <coughs> but perhaps more formal recognition of what does mentorship mean when it goes into a P&T process or in an annual review or something else. How do we formally recognize the value of mentorship and the outcomes that come from that institutionally? Um, and all of this to sort of you know, culminate in, in an advancing our culture of mentorship for purposes of um, you know, engaging in our research, for dissemination, for students' future careers, and what that means, not just institutionally, but of course, to the work that we actually want to do. So um, thank you all for coming here. I know the sessions are quite different. We are interested in feedback, uh, questions and comments and interest. And I think we're pretty well on time, I hope. We're right on time. Thank you to Drs. Benninghoff, Virgiliano, Varghese, and Chamberlain. Thank you so much. Trying to be a 
aggressive about this, but I saw a couple points that you guys just talked about, campus-wide, campus-wide. This doesn't seem particularly inclusive, given that you have half the faculty, you know, half the students here at statewide campuses. Do you have any plans to sort of expand this or make these kinds of things available to those of us that do mentorship at statewide campuses? Let me repeat the question because they said they want it for the mic. So if I can synthesize the question, we had talked about on campus here, and you're asking, how do we get this to other USU campuses that are also involved in research scholarship otherwise? Do you want me to answer? Do you want to take it? Okay. So I, when I say campus, probably I should use a different language. I mean system-wide. So there, because we have learned how to use um, Zoom and other uh, accessible platforms, I don't see a limitation in faculty at our other campuses from engaging in these sorts of activities. I am aware, although I need to learn more about it, there are some faculty mentoring programs that are focused on our, our other statewide campuses that if you're interested in, um, you can take a look at. I would suggest contacting Rich Etchberger about those. Um, but I don't see this as being exclusive to the Logan campus necessarily. Um, I, we have found that um, in-person discussions are maybe easier than our online type of discussions, but if we have a facilitator who's part of our team, who's in Blanding or Moab, who can help run a cohort in parallel, have a few faculty there to have an in-person discussion at the same time we're having an in-person discussion, and then find other ways to integrate those cohorts together in a second hour virtually, we can get creative about that and be inclusive. Yeah, I think it's probably we're talking about it outside of this. In terms of the Riches program and all of that, um, yeah, I, I'd like to just talk to you about it. If you have other thoughts afterwards, please do reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you.